Hello friends and welcome to the Storyteller's Guide on Gilding Light, where we take adventure storytelling to the next level. Thanks to our sponsors, Idol Champions of the Forgotten Realms and World Anvil. You've taken your adventurers on quest after quest. They've leveled and earned magic items, have had major effects on the world, and now you are ready to introduce them to an epic story. In this episode, we'll go over what it means to run an epic game and the ways to integrate elements like deities to make your players feel like who they are makes more of a difference in the cosmos. I'm Satin Phoenix, your story guide for today's Storyteller's Guide episode called Epic Adventure! To start, I want to make sure you know I'm not talking about epic level tier as in D&D levels 20 plus. We are going to discuss epic storytelling. Essentially, the feeling of an epic tier without the specifics of characters in Godhood. So, let's start with what makes for an epic game. In the first levels, your group usually interacts with a person or a small village or tavern. You work your way through levels by working out personal quests that help a person, or two, with a dilemma. From there you grow your skills to be able to help a group of people like a faction or a village. Soon, you're building your way up to saving kingdoms or forests. When we talk epic games, we're talking more about adventures where stakes are world changing. In the last episode we discussed making meaningful choices. It's in these epic games you see how your choices have driven you to this moment and have made you the one of very few heroes who are capable of saving the universe. So, let's talk about stakes. For an adventure to feel epic, you'll need to up the stakes of what happens if the plan fails. People are wiped out of existence. Memories are erased. Enslaved planets. Breaking it down, you see that the real stake of these choices is loss at an unfathomable scale. The removal of freedom, life, or choice that could affect the lives and even generations of beings. Time erased. Time travel to past or future. Manipulation of history by new variable. Changing history by using information from future or other means. Here you see that the stake is truth. By manipulating time and affecting other people's realities, life as a world knows it can be changed forever. For good or ill, by allowing the change, your adventurers are confronted with moral right and wrong. Deity death or enslavement. Changing of a pantheon. Change in a culture's belief system. In this set of examples, we see the stake is faith. What are the ramifications of going head to head with a deity? owing a deity a favor or changing the belief system of a culture? What are the player's responsibilities and what could the side effects be? When one form of power is removed, it makes way for other powers to take hold. Epic stories are more than putting your adventurers in front of a bunch of bad guys with higher hit points and damage dice. It's about upping the stakes and involving beings that could literally move mountains, like deities and the cosmos. In Idol Champions, deities are most often represented through tokens earned during events and through the divine favor earned through completing adventures and variants, rewarding players by allowing them to purchase blessings. Take this into your story or game by using physical representations for your characters to interact with and remember where they are. Either with actual tokens or something with weight and iconography the characters can't just put into their pocket to forget about. In many myths, you hear of deities who interact with humans. Like any NPC, consider what the deity would want from the adventurers, and why said deity wouldn't just will something into existence. Is it because they don't want other deities to know? Is it because they can't directly affect the world? Writing these facts down will help you ground your gods into the reality they exist in. Here are a few helpful deity suggestions from our friends at worldanvil.com. Having gods as fully realized characters using the World Anvil character template will help you plan their responses and reactions. 
By creating the logic behind your divine powers, you'll make it easier when players come to interact with them. Remember to include your divines in the fabric of your world building. They are vast powers and should permeate everything. Your deities' names may crop up in people's or places' names and in idioms, and their power may be shown in the landscape of your world. This helps foreshadow their importance before the PCs ever interact with them. You can prepare all of this Unrolled Anvil ahead of time or document it after the session. Now. Let's discuss all of this with our special guests and begin our quest here on the Storyteller's Guide. After these short videos. Hi, I'm Benwin Bronzebottom, celebrity dwarf and video game enthusiast, and this is my sidekick, Crowy. Hello. We're here to tell you about Idle Champions of the Forgotten Realms, a Dungeons & Dragons-based strategy management game from Codename Entertainment. They're Canadian, so you know it's good. Let's talk about the game. Did you ever play Cookie Clicker? Of course not. This game is a management game like that, but with far more emphasis on strategy. And with a flavoring of D&D's lore and legendary heroes, you can unlock your favorite champions like Farida from Aaron M. Evans' Brimstone Angels Saga, Minsk and Boo from Baldur's Gate, and the fourth and final member of Acquisitions Incorporated the C-Team, Amy Falcone's Walnut Dongross. The K is silent. Create the best adventuring party possible based on the formation options, your character's ability, and the obstacles and enemies you face. Or you just randomly click on things like I do and hope for the best. You can click on enemies to assist your champions, or you can set them up and walk away and let them do their thing. It's entirely up to you. I'm playing on the toilet right now. Why wouldn't you be? Idle Champions is available on all your favorite gaming platforms, including tablets, for the low, low price of free. So download it now. End with joke. You're not supposed to read it that. It says end with joke. No, we're supposed to come up with a joke to go with oh. where it says end with joke. I don't know. End with joke is pretty funny. Wait, on three. Ready? Yeah. One, two, three. End, end with, with joke. joke. <laughs> I think it's funny. It's very funny. One of the biggest problems that storytellers face while in session is that when you're searching through your notes and books, you're breaking the flow of the game. World Anvil allows you to manage your lore, the stat blocks of your PCs, NPCs and monsters, your music, handouts, and so much more from a single screen. Fill your maps with lore and bring your worlds to life by connecting locations, NPCs, races, and monsters to the lands of your world with interactive maps. Track the history of your world, the adventures of your party, and all your major NPCs with timelines. World Anvil is not just for D&D 5e, it supports any other game you want, since you can build stat blocks in any system you're running and play your campaign in it, as every proper homebrew tool should aim to do. Oh. And you can make your own system, too. Create an account now at worldanvil.com and join the World Builders Guild. Use the code STORYTELLER for a whopping up to 30% off Master and Grandmaster memberships. That's worldanvil.com. Hi guys and welcome to the Storyteller's Guide here on Gilding Light where we teach you how easy and amazing it is to create stories and we're going to do that with our guests in about a half hour-ish. Today we have amazing guests. To my right, your left, we have Kyle Vogt who you've seen on the internet as Peter on the movie The Room. We also have Jody Hauser, comic book writer who has written Star Wars, Stranger Things and a little something called Critical Role. Thank you guys so much for being here today. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So, I know all about you, but I want everyone to know about you. So, tell me please some of your favorite things about creating the stories that you do. Um, well, I started writing when I was seven years old, and then I started writing seriously when I was eight years old. So, um, just in terms of creating story, that's kind of all I've known since I was very young. Uh, just the idea of not writing doesn't compute for me. Like, I don't think I would be able to keep functioning. Um, but yeah, so just telling stories. I think it maybe goes back to just reading a ton as I was a kid. And my dad always liked telling stories from his childhood. So I think growing up just around that definitely influenced me. But yeah, I mean, I'd, I've just been writing almost as long as I can remember. It's part of who you are. You are a storyteller. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I'm in the same boat. I was telling stories since I was a little kid, so it's what I've always liked to do. Uh, a lot of reading, of course, leads into it. And uh, I find that 
it's easy to get in ideas that I have across if I'm telling them through a story. Awesome. Well, are you guys ready to create an adventure? Sure. Fantastic. <laughs> so today's prompts are, we're going to create an epic game and it has to include some like cosmic creatures, um, some deities, and let's see what else. The characters should be really, really high level, like 14th level, really badass. And imagine it's about, if we're turning it into a game, which we will, <laughs> it's about five or six hour game. Okay. All right. And it's fantasy setting you want to do? Yeah, I mean, that works we for me. We can do whatever you guys want. It's your adventure. So I was asking. So, yeah, fantasy. Yeah. Um, let's see, what's a good one? What if, what if someone has stolen the, uh, the box of summer and winter is stuck until they can find it and have to open it up to let summer out. Otherwise the world's going to freeze to death and everyone's going to die. That works. That's d done. All right. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool. So that's a good log line. So I assume the one who stole it was the cosmic entity. Or one of them. I yes. mean, maybe it's someone from another world where they've never had summer. That could be that. Yeah, yeah. so there's definitely like a sympathetic definitely. element. I always like the villains, you know, the monsters and the villains who have that, you know, understandable, relatable side yeah. because I think it inspires players to find maybe more creative ways around it than yeah. just, you know, hacking and slashing, as fun as that is, too. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is what happens to the deity of summer without the chest? Do they fall into a, a deep sleep and they're in like in a coma until the chest comes back? And that's how the party stumbles into this is they find this deity just lying down in the middle of- Like Snow White style inside yeah. of like a glass case. Or, it's, it's ice. Yeah, it's frozen ice. in It'd ice. Frozen yeah. because of winter. Because they stay frozen all, all winter until the chest opens and cracks. Nice. Yeah, maybe the chest contains the only fire that can melt winter's ice. Yep. Yeah. Which then they like take up and they put on their head like a crown and that's the sun that they yeah. travel around with. Like um, but we've got to have a group of people. Um, a priest would probably be good. Oh yeah, you need to have someone who has the knowledge yeah. um, there. Uh, uh, do we have someone who needs redemption? I mean, always. Yeah. There's always someone who needs uh, redemption. Would that be... <laughs> Normally, that's like the, the sneaky thief types, but I think it would be nice if it was more like the, the warrior type. Or it could be the priest, even. Uh, we don't want to smush them too much together. Yeah, but, I mean, maybe they, they could all need redemption. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I, I am almost always play characters that have, like, <laughs> some sort of messed up past. Someone has to be their guiding light. Yeah. Um, so, let's see, we got a priest. Well, then what would be the key component for the warrior type? Would it be they're trying to save somebody or are they related to someone else in the group? Um, I mean, if they're more like a paladin type, they could definitely have sworn an oath to protect, you know, whatever area they're from. And thus, you know, if winter is never going to end, all the crops are going to die, their people are going to die. True. So, you know, they're sort of gone on the quest to find out what's going on. Does that mean the priest should be like a priest of nature? Uh, I mean, I would think so, yeah. yeah. yeah that sounds like pretty good. So you've got uh, like a pious uh, puritanical warrior and then the priest of the nature. What about... We gotta have somebody who knows magic. Yeah. Because sure. they've gotta be jumping around in the world, if not into other worlds. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they definitely need that. And definitely someone with some firepower for mostly dealing with ice stuff. True. True. You gotta have the spells. Yeah. Um, well, you've always had the scatterbrain wizards, which are fun, but what if the wizard's actually a calculating owner of a business? and they have to pay off this wizard in order to get them to actually help them in the way that they convince them that it's in their best interest is... Like a, so, so like a strict pragmatist. Totally. It's like, yeah. it's, that my, it's not my contract. I'm not going to do that. So at some points, they're going to have to figure out problems without magic. Uh, it's always fun to have those characters in the yeah. group because, I mean, I like when there's a little bit of conflict. I mean, you want everyone to have sort of the same end goals, but, you know, mixing things up a little bit and having some... Yes. 
people in the party that need to be persuaded a certain way is... As long as it's not too much. But yes. Yeah. Uh, but these are like a high level people, so they're definitely going to be established. Yeah. So yeah, in charge of his own company and the others being well known. And, and these NPCs are characters we're talking about. These are the characters. four main characters. Yeah. All right, so now we're talking. Okay, so yeah. we've got the actual characters. Yes, and then the fourth one. Do you want to mm. go with like the bard type or the rogue type? Or are you going to go with the? I don't. We definitely need someone with the charisma and probably yeah. some of the perform. We need the face of the group. You want to face so. the the sneaky bard or the the. the uh, I, I'm now. I'm just imagining a bard who's like dream has always been to perform at the summer festival and if summer oh. never happens <laughs> they won't get to do it so that's their entire motivation like you know people dying whatever but i i need my starring role moment very much that, that sounds pretty cool <laughs> yeah um so we've got them they know that that the what the goal is they, but they don't know who's taking it right so the bad guy if they're are they have they left for the other world yet i think they I would say the first the first act would be them finding out who the bad guy is. Yeah. And the second act is going to the other world. Yes. Who's the bad guy? I mean, we said our like cosmic baddie who is from a world that's never had summer and is like stolen this that is fire. This is my summer. <laughs> yes. But did but if they were in another world, did they have to get an agent in this world to steal the chest? Probably. Yeah, I think they need. I think that would be part of the first act is yeah. finding who the so, sort of traitor to their own world is. So the first act traitor would be somebody like um, uh, a monster that was exiled from their country because they had been defeated in a war, and so they are just looking for some kind of revenge, and they know that they can live off the dead bodies of everybody who's going to die in the winter, so they don't care if summer comes. And, and they're also like impervious to cold. Yeah. So. And then they have to steal the chest and get it to the other other world. And that's where the party ends. The first one was the chest. They do the chest chase for all the first act. And they lose it just before it gets tossed into the portal to the other dimension. And I, I think uh, we also need sort of the minions of Summer who sort of have to recruit the heroes in the first place. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, like the sort of helpful NPCs. I agree. So. Um, <clears throat> like uh, pixie types, or are you talking more like more like mobile plant types? Which, which uh, I think did? more like pixie types. Yeah. Uh, you know, someone who has some some level of magic and knowledge, but not nearly enough to complete the task. So you reach out to the renowned heroes of the world. So you have little pixies that look like, um, let's say, uh, flowers. Sure. And so they're all their and their heads are all kind of like small and closed and they're up. They're so cold now they can't yeah. move as well. Because yeah. yeah. it's not summer. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then they lead them to the first situation where they find the god in the ice. I think uh, yeah, I think they need to sort of see what the stakes are mm -hmm. and then get at least some sort of hint as to what has happened and who they need to find. I think part of the first act is discovering who the traitor is for their world. Now, do they show up in the, the nature priest's garden? Is that how they find out? Does Maybe, it, I mean, touched on? it's especially if we don't know if these heroes are really connected to each other when it starts, especially if this is more like a one shot story. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, it could be wherever each of the heroes are, some plant sort of suddenly comes to life and is like, help us. Yep, that sounds cool. Go to go to this this location <laughs> at this time. So the chest chase happens, and then they've got to j take the leap of faith to go into the portal. Yes, into a world that they know nothing, nothing about. about. Yeah. So that means this other world that's never had summer. So that means is it dark, and thus it's never had summer because it doesn't have light at all, and thus now they're stuck in this, and they're leaning on their paladin or. Whomever. Yeah, hopefully some of them have night vision. Or <laughs> um, they bring magical light into the world for the first time and getting the attention of all the things that are there that don't yeah, know what they are. Yeah, that that seems like it would be extra. Now I'm thinking of uh, what's the pitch black. The pitch black, very yeah. similar, where all the things live on the edges of your, your campfire. Yeah, um, that would be really cool. But that means the chest is somewhere in the dark and they don't know. So they've got to find their way to the big bad guy. Yeah, and it might also be that the 
bad guy has gotten the chest but doesn't have the means to open it. So there's sort of like a ticking clock mm -hmm. because he has to do some sort of ritual or spell to be able to access the fire in the chest. And once the chest has been opened in this world, it can never be brought back to the world it, was, it came from. Okay. Um, so does that mean that the end of the second act turn is going to be that the chest gets opened in the No, the they world? have to they have to stop or, the ritual. Or but... is, so the second act turn would be they get the chest, but it gets stolen from them again. Um, I mean, I it's one of those things where I think the story could go a couple different ways depending mm -hmm. on what players would do. So. True, but you've got to give them a couple of options yeah. to deal with. Yeah, I mean, I think I think if we're setting up that it, once the chest is open in this world, the other world is done. Gone. They can't open it. Or they, the chest gets open, but it turns out that's not the chest. That was actually a fake chest sold to this one by the trader the trader initially and the trader actually is keeping the real chest back in the original world why because he couldn't actually move it from world to world or they're wanting to use the power for their own purposes oh. so they could use it to take out the country that they lost the war to yeah basically scorching it into like a barren wasteland so basically dooming the world for a like one time just devastating yes. strike and that would be the turn is they think that they've lost, but the uh, the light that they brought to the other world, they can actually bargain with the entities over there uh, and get back. Even though they didn't actually stop the chest from being opened, it wasn't the real chest. And that was the reveal that they that the entities over there just needed light in order to not have to deal with what they So the dealing. trader would have to be a pretty powerful spellcaster if they can create a chest that has the same sort of protections sure. on it as the real thing. Or uh, at least an illusionist of some kind. More powerful than they come across. Obviously our party is not really good with illusions, so it's easily deceivable. So, but then that's the, in the second world, is it another chase or is it going to be they have a mystery to solve in order to get through it. I think they have a mi I mean, they might end up having to work with this cosmic entity because- How does they get back? Yeah, how, how did they get back? What happened to the chest? Is he lying? Uh, was he lied to? I mean, there there is the mystery element there. That what, does like, yeah. what does he need? Like, what does he actually They have to want? figure out what they need. And if they can provide that, then they get to go back. Yeah, and if they just like straight up try to kill him, they might be stuck there forever. forever. Yeah. As you do. It sometimes happens. So let's talk yeah. a little bit about this, the actual bad guy. The, the which bad guy? The traitor bad guy. Yeah. yeah. So let's develop that character a little more since that seems to be the backbone of this whole adventure. Who shows up in the third when they have to go back and stop him. Yeah. So uh, what is, let's, let's go, who is it? Why do they do what they do? What do they really want? Like, what is his personality? And then... Uh, show what his personality was when they, he first got introduced. Well, the original thought was it was a monster who was part of a nation that got defeated in a war with the prevailing lands that the main characters belong to. Yeah, and I think he very much plays down, you know, the intelligence and ability. So it's just sort of seems like a, you know, sort of just... Brutish? Brutish and you know, just sort of acting without having like a long-term plan at all. Like, well, you just doomed the world, but I can eat the dead people, whatever. <laughs> you know, uh, exactly. and you don't actually know how deep their plan goes. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I think they definitely come across as someone who isn't the big bad. They're sort of like the bumbling henchman type. Do they set, set up somebody else to be the big bad when they're actually in charge as the sidekick henchman? Well, I think that's the, co you know, they're painting the cosmic deity that they sold the fake chest to as the big bad right. when it was just someone who was part oh, of true. their scam. It's true. Uh, it falls very much in the Kaiser Sose sort of thing. Yeah. So, and I think the idea is like, if I send the heroes to this other world, they won't be able to stop me and they'll exactly. be trapped there forever. So. Get rid of them so they're not in the way. Yeah. Um, but then the motivations are get revenge be uh, very diabolical and machinicious, Machiavellian. Yeah. Um, so that means they're going to be, what? Um, were they excluded from their normal groups because they were too smart and they're doing this sort of- Well, I think they're the, like they might be the last survivor of their people. Okay. That's good. Do you have any other questions on that person? Um, no, but, uh, well, kind of, yes. I. 
what are the obstacles that they ha like? Does this person have minions that that work for him that helped him? Is he doing it literally all on his own? Uh, what are the um, the ob the yeah? What are the obstacles? Well, in the first chapter, the obstacle is the chase. So they've got to track and catch him. Yeah. But second, the well, third what act. If, okay, so oftentimes I have noticed that uh, my players are far more clever than I give them credit for. And they will uh, come up with really good solutions to catch uh, something. Mm -hmm. Do we want him to be caught? They have to catch him at the end because that's how he throws the chest in the portal to get rid of them. And if they don't catch him... They're okay. still going to be around. And um, so, yeah, so if they make... catch him too soon, right? And then all of a sudden that encounter is just like cut short really fast. What can you introduce to make it a, like an, a fulfilling encounter? Um, I mean, I think there needs to be a way for the portal to happen, even if he's yeah. caught early. Like, it's not a specific like time or place thing. Right. It's not a ceremony of some particular thing. Uh, I was thinking more along the lines of the chase is more of. Um, they're chasing him and gets caught in dead ends. Since we've already established that they're somewhat proficient in illusions, it's easy to just have them go, oh, you took the wrong way, like shifting paths in a forest and they get caught in a, a bramble at the dead end and they don't know how the bad guy got away when it's actually, they never went down that path. It was an illusion that they chased down that yeah, path. Yeah, you just have to make sure that they don't know that that's an illusion. the, yeah. And that also that it was caused by this like supposedly bumbling monster that they're chasing. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, so that would keep them from catching things too early, but when they actually do come up with clever things, they do get the reward of stopping something. They just don't know that it's not really the real one. All right. So once they get through the portal, what are the obstacles they have to get to get to the actual crate? The bad guy? Or are you talking like the cosmic darkness? I want to know all of it. So okay. let's fill in that big blank. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's definitely a fun place to come up with like sort of monsters yeah. that are completely alien to anything that they would know because it's a different world. So, and I do, I do like the pitch black metaphor yeah. where it's, you know, things that uh, can only function in the dark because that's all they've ever experienced. It's so like radar bats. Yeah. yeah. Like... Oh, def definitely things that fly because there's nothing creepier than like stuff dive bombing uh, you darkness. in the dark. <laughs> and since they're limited on their vision, they can't see what's outside their the radius of light. So then they've got lots of things that could be stalking them with, that they don't know about noises and tricky little things to, to give them a little spooky edge to them. Yeah, but again, these aren't necessarily things that are evil they're yeah. just you know they would see these people coming in as you know a, an attack on their land so i yeah. think it's a good place to have mm -hmm. you know someone like our bard character yep. who's more charismatic try to negotiate with these you know creatures rather than just slaughtering everything yeah. so i think there's a there can be multiple ways to play that mm -hmm. sort of that sort of uh, obstacle so cool so how far from the portal to the cosmic entity are we like is it Since like it's in a, that same building is it in the like are you arriving into a village like what where is this place that you're arriving to i think you gotta find the big fancy castle yeah uh, yeah that's good big fancy castle so uh, i think it might not necessarily be difficult to find it's just going to be difficult to get, get through okay cool um I'll, if you want the big fancy castle is it gonna have anything spooky and special like is it upside down Upside down is good. Since it's a different weird like a world. Stalag my stalactite? Stalactite. Which one? Stalactite? Yeah. Yes! It's an upside down castle attached to the ceiling. And it's which, surrounded by Which people bat can't people. have to fly Guards? into. Yeah. yeah. Which means they have to cut a deal with the monsters in order to get up to it. Unless they're lucky enough they can fly. Or, or, they, or they find some, yeah. some really clever way. But yeah, I think yeah. the easiest way to get in is to make a deal with the locals. Exactly. Cool. So you've got some uh, exploration, you've got some social encounters, then you have to get in and you have guards that are guarding it. Um, but this isn't the end. This is only like halfway to, so you, um, you do, how difficult do you make it to get in? Well, it's gotta be somewhat difficult, otherwise they'll feel like that they're not actually yeah. going up against the big bad guy. 
Yeah, and I think uh, especially once they reach the castle area, that's when you get like the time, the sort of time limit aspect because I think a ticking clock always makes things more stressful. Always. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so they basically have to get into the castle and get to the you know ritual room mm -hmm. and stop the cosmic entity before he opens the chest and, and that's their the kind world. Of information that the other guy would give, right? So like uh, you could, no, gonna... that would be information they would get from the beings in the dark world. I mean, I think they would have gotten it from the minions of Summer. Oh, you yeah, think like, they would know that the minion in the other world is going to try to open it. By well, I think it would time? just be like you know, once if the if the box is open, if the well, if anywhere that. in the wrong place, then like, Summer could be doomed forever. True. Yeah. Nice. They would lose the Summer because they couldn't put it back in the box without the God here who's encased in ice. Yeah. So the characters get to this cosmic entity, mm -hmm. and they want to defeat this cosmic entity. How do you reveal that the box is the wrong box? Uh, the, they get to there just in time to see the box opened. <laughs> okay. Or they, they get there in time where it looks like it's going to be open and they get into the combat with it. And if they don't stop them, it gets open. But if they do stop it, it gets broken and it opens. So it opens either way. And then you can see it's not, it's, oh, there's nothing in it but a little note. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you, it is a fake box this guy's been swindled let's get him a little more detail of how we can get back to our world well the light that they brought with them is something that the the new god could use over there as opposed to being full summer it could actually just start growing things yeah um, so yeah so you have to cut a deal and then there's also the well you know this this you know monster just totally scammed you and we can go get revenge for you. You what know, if, you gotta take care of your people, we'll take care of the revenge for you. What if the nature priest had a staff that one of the abilities was it could glow like the sun and that's what they had to leave behind? Oh yeah, so he loses oh. his most powerful yeah. weapon. Or, like or, at least, or at least one that's important to them. Yeah, yeah, like, and that has to be a choice to yes. make. Yeah. They can either leave it behind or they're stuck. So this cosmic entity could um, jail them if they don't want to cooperate. They could um, negotiate with the cosmic entity to work with them. So there's a lot of things could happen where, you know, maybe they're stuck in jail until they come up with a solution to negotiate or whatever it is. But either way, there is a time limit because even if they get back, they still have to get back in time for uh, to prevent this person from opening. Because the note inside the chest lets them know the plan. Because you got to have your good villain monologue. Yeah. <laughs> ha, 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 you're so dumb. You didn't stop me. Now I'm going to destroy your country, which all blah, blah, blah. Awesome. Okay, so we provide a way for them to get back. Another portal opens. And then? Now that they're back, then they've got to deal with the fact that they don't know where the chest is. Yeah. They know who they're looking for, though, because they, uh, I think, however they ended up finding the monster in the first the first act will play Still into works. how they find them yeah. in the third act, so... Yeah, so they, they know ways to get to it. The question is, what? how far along is the, the guy on the revenge? I mean, actually, the, an interesting thing, because we didn't really set up if the monster had any minion sort of things. If the if he hasn't let his minions in on his plan and they the heroes tell them, like, oh, no, he's going to destroy our whole country, that might be a way. Yeah. Yeah, they might be able to um, turn the minions against the monster. Oh, that's cool. So they're fighting the minions until they tell the minions what's going on, and then the minions turn to help them save yes. their own skin. Yeah. Awesome. So this big bad guy is way more big bad -er than uh, expected. This is a good like party versus big bad guy fight. And then uh, they either win or they don't win, and we are wrapping up our adventure. We only have a couple questions left. Okay. What's the name of this big bad guy? Which one? The traitor guy? Yeah. I don't know. I think he needs just like a really unassuming so sort of like... Uh, like... Scabrous. Yeah. Okay. And what is the name of the cosmic entity? Um, the one that wanted the, the chest that ended up with the light? Just wants to grow some things. <laughs> <laughs> um, crawl. Crawl? Yes, but like spelled with like K, K and yeah. yeah. Two E's in the end. <laughs> cool. Awesome. And what is the name of this town that we're in? That, you know, everything starts off in. Oh, the, the village? Mm-hmm. 
Uh, Bronzewood. Okay. Last question. Are you ready? Yes. What is the name of this adventure? Um, Winter's End. Beautiful. That was way less painful than I expected. <laughs> <laughs> you expected us to suffer. Uh, yes, I did. Yeah. Uh, well, that's usually the hardest part. But today, everyone's been really cool about Ooh. like fast, bing, bang, boom with the names. Okay. Thank you guys so much for being here on the Storyteller's Guide. Please share with everyone at home where they can find you on the internet. You go first. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Jody underscore Hauser and on Instagram at Mind Eclipse. You can find me on Twitter at Kyle Vogt and on Instagram at Kyle.Vogt. And I'm Satine Phoenix at Satine Phoenix on all the social medias. You can find me here on Gilding Light all the time. And if you guys like what you see, hit subscribe and uh, tell us about your epic adventures and your cosmic deities. And thank you to our sponsors, Idol Champions and World Anvil. Thank you for keeping our lights on. And also, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but we're in a pretty sweet bar here in Sherman Oaks, California called The Sherman. So stop by, have a drink, grab some food. And until we meet again, dear storytellers, ciao, ciao. Thank you.